Welcome to Australia at Home and to our second Guardian Australia Book Club. Anyone who came to our first, welcome back. Everyone else, you are in for a treat today. Just a bit about the theme today. So we've framed this around a Guardian Australia column we launched in lockdown, which is loose title, what's the Australian book you finally have time to read. Tara June Winch is zooming in all the way from France, where it is extremely early in the morning. Thank you, Tara. She wrote one of last year's most astounding novels in The Yield, and she chose Alexis Wright's Carpentaria as the book to take into lockdown. The Yield was picked as one of Guardian Australia's unmissable books of 2019, as was The Brilliant Damascus by Christos Solkis, who also joins us now. He picked Randolph Stowe's The Merry-Go-Round in the Sea to literally take into quarantine with him. Michael Williams, he's leading the discussion with them both. So I'm going to throw to them all now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. And a big hello to everyone joining us for this, our second book club. We thought this month we would throw things a little wider. We have two extraordinary authors, as Steph said, as our guests, but we're approaching them more as readers than as writers themselves. And uh, as the Guardian series suggests, we're reflecting on the ways in which maybe there are Australian books that we haven't quite got around to and that we might be reading now, finally, when we have a little bit more time on our hands. But to kick things off, I thought I might come to you, Christos, um, and ask what your first memory of being taught Australian literature was. What was your first awareness that an author you were reading was an Australian? Uh, what I remember was find and maybe you one of you will help me with this what i remember was finding a book in the library in the in um uh, a, a suburban library and it had a little boy walking through the streets of melbourne a child really who hears some music and he becomes fascinated by the music i've never ever been able to uh to trace who that um who that little boy was and what that book was. So if anyone who is listening to, the, to, to this knows, please, please um, tell me now, because it was my first awareness of that a book could be set in your town. You know, I, I must have been, if I think back to it, I must have been the first year of high school. So maybe 11, 12. The other memory that's really, really strong, and it's again, it's about your world being made familiar is being a teenager and coming across Monkey Grip in a suburban bookshop and actually sitting on the floor of the bookshop and a wonderful woman used to run it and just starting to read it. I think I read half the book in that city. Booksellers must love you. <laughs> I love them. But I might throw to you all the way in the other hemisphere there, Tara, and ask you the same question. Do you have memories of early discoveries of Australian writers for you? It wasn't really until I had a publishing contract with UQP and because I was living in my van, they actually gave me an office. I gave me a space in the office at the publishers to write, to write Swallow the Air. And so all I read was what was there at UQP. That was like my first introduction to Australian writing. And because they've got the Black Australian writing series, that was my first introduction to Australian literature. It sounds like a wonderful introduction in that it was one that had direct relevance to both your own writing and the experience of discovery. I might get you, Tara, to talk a little bit about Alexis Wright and Carpentaria. Many of you in the book club may have read Tara's fantastic piece for the Guardian's series on why this is a, a kind of work of Australian literature you revere. Can you tell us a little bit about what that book means to you, Tara? I mean, there's so many great Indigenous novelists in Australia. There were too many to recommend. And of course, it was always going to be a black fellow literature that I was going to recommend. But this was sort of, you know, it's a difficult book to read. It's not until you get into that second half that you can sort of, you know, feel comfortable that you're going to get to an end point. Um, and it, I think it was, it was like pushing on that difficulty. It was like, do the hard yards, read this difficult, beautiful, challenging, one you want to going to put down. And that's why I kept insisting you have to read all the way through. Um, I think foremost, it's such a brave novel. It's so experimental with language, the way that Alexis tackled the idea of all time within a novel and the playfulness with the English language is powerful. And the fact that it's so big is another one. 
I thought it was really important for Australian readers to completely immerse themselves in the story and they really do get immersed with these characters that the story is a story that comes up again and again and ha always has in Aboriginal writing and it mixes issues of mining and disenfranchisement from the land, the impact of colonisation, jutting up against the dreaming and all time and the beauty of culture and the, the balm of culture. That's sort of a signifier of all our literature. But for me, when I really love a book, I'm, d I'm always attracted to the language and the playfulness with how people use words rather than a plot, an over a plot or a, a point to get to. And for me, Carpentry is a piece of art. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes, it makes perfect sense. It's such a, um, actually reading your piece about it made me want to go back and reread it. There was a review, I can't remember where it was, of one of Marilyn Robinson's novels once that said that it was a novel that taught you how to read it as you read it. And I think that a bit about Carpenteria, that I had to find the rhythms and, and it's an incredibly generous book. It invites you into the language. And you're right, it tells you how to read it, like just to calm down. Yeah, it was, it's like that she wants you to be in a state. I don't know. See, I don't, it's funny to talk about other people's writing. Um, when they're not here to talk about themselves. I don't want to get it wrong, you know? We have a comment from Melanie who had to read Carpenteria a second time. Melanie, are you there? Oh, I was just making the comment that I, I read it not long after it was published and adored it, but I felt more recently and ironically before Tara's article, um, I had gone back and reread it. And I just think that the characters are so complex that a second reading is really valuable to start to unpick where they're all coming from and what all the messages are behind this sort of magical place and yet there's so much um, relevance to the story of of displacement and disconnection and connection that uh, I think it warrants uh, certainly much more detailed reading the second time around. I think, thank you, Melanie. I do think there's something in um, the different way we we read stuff a second time around. That uh, rather than getting either um, uh, stuck in uh, in the language or the rhythms of it, or luxuriating in them, um, once we're kind of once we're schooled in those things, uh, we see very different things a second time around. Um, Christos, I know you're a fan of Alexis's work as well. Yeah, look, I was, I mean, I, I think that thing both of you were, were saying about it being a, a book that teaches you how to read is absolutely right. I think that's one of the things I've got to be so thankful for too, to my parents, to, to dad for, you know, by giving me books that were too adult for me, by giving me books that were <laughs> impossible for a 9, 10, 11 year old child to understand. He also gave me this gift of saying, uh, he didn't know it, but it was like you, if you do this work, something magic will happen in, in, in the process. Christos, I'm interested to know when you came across Randolph Stowe, who's your pick for this series, and what it was that resonated about his work with you as a reader. I was thinking about, um, as we were discussing Alexis, his work I think it's a very similar re reaction I had to my first encounter with Stowe, which was through uh, Tourmalin, the um, a novel, and I wrote about it in, in, in the piece for The Guardian. I, I came across it. I feel like a, a little bit ashamed that I hadn't read Stowe before, you know, but I was completely, I just couldn't stop reading it. And it was because it's also a novel, I think, for that you have to work at to hear it, right? And it's also a novel that is so acutely aware of how important the word is. You know, that's what makes uh, fiction. I thought this is a remarkable writer and I want to um, I want to read more of him. And then I came to Merry Go Round in the Sea, which I just think is one of the most beautiful works I've read. <laughs> I flew back from Europe and went immediately into two weeks quarantine and where you could still do it at home. And I was pulling books off this off these shelves be, be behind me. They stretch across the room. And Merry Go Round in the Sea was uh, one of the novels I pulled out because I just wanted to... I guess uh, there is an other element to reading, which is also the, the pleasure 
I just wanted to be in pleasure for 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 a period. The the engine of the book, it seems to me, is so much one about kind of grace and mm. kindness. Yeah. And, and uh, that feels like a very rare kind of motivating force for a novel. <laughs> I actually think that that's a really good word to use, kindness, because I think kindness is there in every novel of his that I've, I've, I've read. A real kind of generosity about humans. Like all us white fellas, he, he, he failed at trying to make sense of our place in this collection of nations in this country, in this world, it's, it's a, we're still working that out. But I, I think he came with a really generous heart. That's what I get from, from reading Stoke. I'm going to give both of you uh, one uh, last opportunity to name one other author who you would feel guilty if you didn't name uh, an Australian author who you think is neglected or forgotten. Okay, get ready to take screenshots. Are you ready? Because I'm going to hold them up. Right. Ready? It's going to be fast. Ready? Go. So this one, it's um, Ruby Langford Guinevere. Read all her work. That's essential. This one, Charmaine Capital. This one, Marsha Langton. Welcome to country. Everyone needs to have a copy of this to understand the travel impulse and, and to understand when they do move around the country. And also, <laughs> Beirut's book is really essential to understanding this sense of cruelty that's part of our national psyche. And also Ninu, Grandmother's Lot, which is a bilingual text, and that's the future of Aboriginal writing, is to show more of our languages. That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm also so impressed by that prop work, Tara. You said <laughs> it was your, your first time doing a Zoom, and yet you, you work with the camera like a pro there. <laughs> Christos, what's your tip? That uh, Marshall Langton is, is what I give when I last. I, I just like giving it to gifts uh, um, when I go overseas <laughs> to, to Greece to, to my family. I will say, in all seriousness, the books, the two books came into to my head that I think are undervalued. And, and to the discussion we're having, there's a, a woman called Rosa Capaello who's an Italian and she came as a migrant um, worker to Australia and she wrote one of the most devastatingly brutal novels about, and again, a novel that. It's not, you, you need to work to, to, to hear it. Um, oh, oh, lucky country. I just, I think it's, it's a great work. And um, Anthony Macris's Capital Volume 1, which I, you know, I read in, when it came out and I, I, I was just so ta um, astounded by it and, and envious of it. And I've just reread it recently and my God, it stands up. So I'm going to say that. Excellent. I'm sure you would all join me in thanking uh, the remarkable Tara June Winch and Christos Jolkas. I'm going to throw back to Steph Harmon from The Guardian, but thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Christos. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for the chat as well. I think we're going to try and turn that into some kind of an epic reading list because <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people were taking notes as it kind of scrolled through the screen. Um, we're going to be doing this monthly, so stay tuned to Guardian Australia and Australia at Home to find out what our next session will be. Have a lovely weekend.